Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Apologise for the early wardrobe malfunction just then. I managed to stand up while leaving my uh, microphone attached to the seat, which is not a good kickoff, but never mind. Here we are. Um, welcome to the uh, uh, Howard Memorial uh, um, uh, Lecture. Uh, we've got a really nice evening set up here. Um, and um, Roger Kirby, um, in his inimitable way, uh, flattered me into agreeing to uh, uh, introduce our speaker and to handle a Q&A. What he didn't tell me was he wanted me to run the whole evening as well. <laughs> but uh, this has happened before, so I should have seen that one coming. Um, but it is indeed a great pleasure for me to find myself up here. Um, very nice to see a decent sized live audience too. I know there's a decent sized remote audience out there as well, but uh, I would like to offer my welcome to both groups of you all and hope that you enjoy the evening and also uh, that you feel able to participate actively in the Q&A uh, after, uh, after the main lecture. Um, so at this point, um, uh, I want to uh, introduce um, uh, Alan's, Dr. Alan Howard's son, John Howard, um, who is uh, 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 in the audience here and is going to get up and say a few words. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my father, Alan Howard, who died in June of last year, aged 91, after a full life, would have been delighted to know that a memorial lecture in his name is to be given by the Professor of Clinical Biochemistry and Medicine at the University of Cambridge. Alan Howard himself won a scholarship to Downing College, Cambridge in 1948 to study natural sciences specializing in chemistry. His PhD was on immunology and he stayed associated with the university for some 70 years as student, researcher, teacher, and finally benefactor. He was inspired by the vision of scientific research to overcome human diseases and, to be, and he became a leading scientist in the fields of atherosclerosis, obesity, and nutrition. For the final 20 years of his life, Alan led research into the role of macular carotenoids on vision and memory, latterly working with the Waterford Institute of Technology in Ireland. It is quite remarkable that the first paper in which he is cited as author was published in 1952, and his last was in 2020 at the grand old age of 90. But Alan Howard, of course, is most widely known as the inventor of a very low calorie diet known as the Cambridge diet, the result of many years of research and clinical trials back in the 60s and 70s. Commercial products from this research continue today as the one-to-one -one diet by Cambridge and Lipotrim, which support people to lose weight, including those with medical conditions such as diabetes. Today's lecture celebrates the centenary of the discovery of insulin and its impact on people's lives. For Alan Howard, this was significant because he himself developed diabetes, which he controlled through a daily insulin injection and by managing his diet. This helped to keep him sufficiently healthy until his death from prostate cancer. In 1982, Alan Howard created an English charitable trust, the Howard Foundation, which has supported numerous scientific research projects. His vision was inspired by Henry Wellcome's original template for the Wellcome Foundation or trust. So it is appropriate that this evening's speaker should be Professor Stephen Orahili, the co-director of the Wellcome MRC Institute of Metabolic Science. Alan believed in a cycle whereby the creation of wealth finances research that leads to a healthier society. Alan saw the value of meetings such as this, which discusses important medical and scientific topics to further our knowledge and to stimulate research. Indeed, he traveled to many himself, but today with modern technology, People can now, of course, attend online from anywhere in the world without the need to travel. 
Apologies from my sister, the chairman of the Howard Foundation, Julie Lambert. Uh, but of course, the Howard Foundation uh, is delighted to support tonight's lecture. Thank you very much. And I know that we're all extremely appreciative of that support, which has enabled this evening to take place. And so many thanks on behalf of all the uh, faculty and the uh, <clears throat> attendees. Um, so now I have the great pleasure of introducing uh, my uh, acquaintance uh, and friend, uh, Professor Stephen O'Reilly. Um, Stephen is one of those people with a CV that takes your breath away. Um, and for that reason, partly, I'm not going to go through it in any great detail, but I just ask you to take it from me that this is quite breathtaking stuff. He's been at the cutting edge of basic science, translational uh, medicine, and indeed has functioned as an, as an active clinician at Addenbrooke's for most of his professional career there. He is, as we've heard, the director of the Wellcome MRC Institute for Metabolic Medicine at the University of Cambridge, professor of clinical biochemistry at the University of Cambridge. Uh, he was knighted for his services to uh, science uh, and is a fellow of the Royal Society, unsurprisingly. Uh, he's also a terrific lecturer. I've heard him lecture on related topics in the past and we're in for a treat, I can assure you of that. So it's a great pleasure that I ask Stephen to come to the stage, please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, John, for that very kind introduction. It's, it's great to see an audience and, and, and it's great. It's no, nobody can say to me, you're on mute, which is a real... <laughs> Um, it's an enormous honor and, and privilege to give the first Howard Memorial Lecture, uh, and it was great to meet the Howard family and foundation. We live a few miles from each other in Cambridge, and of course it's typical of these things, first time we've ever met, and I'm sure it won't be the last. So thank you for endowing this, this lecture. So we're here really to celebrate a, a fantastic event that occurred almost exactly a uh, hundred years ago uh, in, in Toronto where this young surgeon, Fred Banting, and his medical student, uh, <clears throat> protege, uh, 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 Charles Best, together with <clears throat> James Collop, an excellent biochemist from Alberta, and, a, and, and the mentor of them both, uh, John McLeod, physiologist, a Scottish physiologist, together uh, <clears throat> came to discover that an extract from the pancreas of dogs could be used in a purified form to reverse the diabetes found in depancreatized dogs. And this amazing piece of physiology to understand that this, these, these cells could be, uh, <clears throat> you could extract from these cells a, a, a single, a, a, a semi-purified substance that could reverse diabetes had immediate translational impact. Uh, I, I find this one of the most moving photographs from around that time, this rather plucky girl <clears throat> with an, an amazing sort of uh, a sense of self-confidence in the face of impending disaster is actually transformed within months of insulin treatment from someone who is near death to the healthy child you see on the right. Such a, a very few times in medicine, you get such a rapid and transformative uh, turn of science. Probably the, the Moderna mRNA vaccine was probably one of the only ones of comparable speed at which a discovery is a molecular science effectively discovery is rapidly turned into a life-saving uh, administration to human beings. I'm really gonna to talk to you today, yes, I'm gonna to talk to you about insulin, but I'm gonna to talk to you about two topics that are very close to my own heart as a, as a scientist and a physician. And that's the topic of metabolism and that of endocrinology. Metabolism is the sum of chemical reactions taking place in the cell of an organism, and they provide energy for all the vital processes. And probably the first person to actually firm up on the concept of metabolism was the great Islamic scholar, Ibn al-Nafis, who, who, who noted that the body and its parts are in continual state of dissolution and nourishment and inevitably going, undergoing perpetual change. Endocrinology, of course, is a bit different. It's the study of hormones, but that, that brings the question, what is a hormone? Well, a hormone is a regulatory substance produced in an organism which goes from one place to another, transported in humans, largely in blood or in mammals, but in plants, in sap, and it regulates the physiology and behavior of the, of the organism. And the term was first used by the British physiologist, Ernest Starling, and he took it from the Greek to set in motion. In fact, as I'll point out soon, actually you only got it half right because many hormones stop things being done as well as start things being, being done. 
So in a way, metabolism is the, are the instruments of the orchestra generating the, the noise we require to start the music of human and mammalian physiology. While the hormones are the conductors that synthesize that music into the beautiful harmonies of the control of, 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 of our health and well being. So today I'm going to give you a tale, a tale of three hormones, hormones that I've sort of fallen in love with over the last uh, 30 years or, or so. Insulin, discovered in 1921, uh, leptin in 1994, and something you probably haven't heard of, which is a new hormone, which I'll tell you about today, called the rather ugly name of GDF-15. What I'll tell you about is a little bit, and I'll, I'll be as brief as I can, uh, what it does and how does it work. I'll try and tell you how it goes wrong in human disease or diseases, and how we might be able to therapeutically benefit people from the manipulation of those hormones. So clearly, <clears throat> insulin is our first hormone that we will visit, having just shown you the magnificent effects of it in its deficiency states. How does it work? Well, insulin is produced in the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas. And when you're fasting, which you are for about 50% of your day, effectively, consider yourself fasting 50% fed 50% of the day, but half the day you're fasting. And the main job of insulin is to go up through the portal system and stop the liver making glucose. And it really very delicately do it because if it gets it wrong once, once in your 80, 90 years, and remember during evolution, getting it wrong is a really bad thing because if you get it wrong, you become hypoglycemic and you get eaten by a saber toothed tiger because your brain doesn't. So the delicacy with which insulin works is remarkable and its consistency and how it works throughout the life span with an astonishing control, a circulating half-life of only four and a half minutes. It is one of the most exquisite intellectual of hormones compared to some of the more boring, long-acting hormones we deal with. It's an amazing uh, thing, delicately controlled throughout our life. How, how does it work? Well, <clears throat> science and the boring nerds, <clears throat> myself included, have worked on trying to figure out how it works at a cellular level for a very long time. And we've gradually learned more and more about how it works through its receptor and how the signals happen through the body and how in the liver for, in particular, it controls things by controlling how many proteins we make, how those proteins are phosphorylated <coughs> and, and, and a very uh, elegant uh, control pathway. But you can see here, there's other inputs into the pathway. And in fact, insulin does, 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 doesn't just do that. Insulin goes through the liver and in the fasting state, it's also keeping a very close eye on how much fatty acids you're releasing from your fat. Your, your, your fat. And it's probably doing as much to control <clears throat> glucose production through that process than it is from directly in the liver itself. So that's how it's working in the, in the fasting state. Now, something totally different happens when you have your bowl of shreddies in the morning. What happens there <clears throat> is that a surge of insulin comes from the pancreas and immediately it hits tissues like skeletal muscle and, and heart muscle. And there a totally different process happens. There, uh, pre-existing little uh, uh, vesicles sitting under the plasma membrane rapidly translocate. So you, you flood your muscle and, skeletal and, and cardiac muscle within minutes with glucose in response to your meal. So the processes that control glucose metabolism are exquisite and tissue specific. And, and for most of us who don't develop diabetes, work extraordinarily well all, all our lives. So to turn first to what the deficiency state leads to, the deficiency state obviously leads to a lethal state of diabetic ketoacidosis, if you, and usually through autoimmune destruction of the pancreatic beta cell. What's happened since the la, in the last hundred years? Well, very briefly, the advances have been improvements in the injection purity and reduction immunogenicity, formulation and bioengineer with improved pharmacokinetics of insulin, improved ways of giving insulin, these horrible old insulin syringes that were even in my early days were used by, by, by patients. Now the sophisticated insulin delivery devices we use, and of course, tremendous advances in people being able to measure their glucose. Uh, so all of these have happened. But, what is, <clears throat> there, but insulin is still, no long, it's, it's, it's still not a perfect therapy by any means for people with type one uh, diabetes. It has limited efficacy in controlling the high blood glucose, there's a continuing risk of disabling hypoglycemia. And for each individual patient, it's a huge burden of day-to-day -day concentration and care to try and steer between the scylla of hypoglycemia and the charybdis of hyperglycemia. So it's, it's an extraordinary 
demand, and it never goes away. It happens every day for, for patients with these disorders. And of course, many places in the world, it's still limited in availability and cost. And it is quite astonishing how many people in the USA still ration their own insulin because they cannot afford to pay the exorbitant costs of insulin uh, in, in, in even places as sophisticated as the United States of America. What is the hope for the future? Well, the two big hopes, of course, are the artificial pancreas, the ability to create this, fate, this, uh, this controlled uh, uh, loop uh, uh, so that you don't have to think about uh, it automatically delivers insulin as, as needed. And of course, cell-based therapies, which have long been touted as the possible uh, great hope for, for them to be able to put back functioning islets into people. And it's good timing this lecture because just a few days ago, uh, uh, the Vertex Pharmaceuticals announced, sadly, in the New York Times, not in a peer-reviewed journal. So we can't really comment very much about, about the, the truth of the matter. Uh, was, but, but it is nonetheless, I think, exciting that, that the first stem cell-derived islets actually functioning in humans have been given to a person with apparent uh, beneficial effects. Not forgetting, of course, that this gentleman has to take immunosuppression uh, for the rest of his life, which has all the risks of cancer and other illnesses. So there's not a solved problem, but this is a, certainly a step in the direction that we might be able to help people with, the, <coughs> with, with, with this. My own view is that where we, the real excitement in the long term is, is preventing type one diabetes, which is an autoimmune disease. And my colleague and old friend, John Todd, now in Oxford was in Cambridge, is you know, at the forefront of trying to understand how, how type one diabetes occurs and trying to design and implement with others, of course, around the world in ways of finding early how people get type 1 diabetes and intervening to stop them getting it. I think that is, is really where we ought to be aiming in the longer term. Much more in my own bailiwick is a much commoner form of diabetes, type 2 diabetes, probably 20 to 50 times commoner than type 1 diabetes. So really, really extraordinarily common, I mean, a, a, a very, very common disease. And it was first identified as different from type 1 diabetes by this paper by Harold Hemsworth in 1936, where he took a young person with diabetes and gave them glucose and insulin and showed that rapidly insulin worked in this young, slim person. But an older person with diabetes who was a bit overweight gave them insulin and nothing happened. And so he divided these into insulin sensitive and insulin insensitive and really coined the term insulin resistance. And in the 50s and 60s, when it became possible to measure insulin, we found that Actually, a lot of people who didn't have diabetes had very high levels of insulin, and they were resistant to their own insulin. And of course, this has now proved to be a central pathogenic mechanism, not only in type 2 diabetes, but also in a range of predisposition to vascular disorders, coronary artery disease, and other, and, and other uh, illnesses. And Jerry Reven, one of the doyens of this field, uh, coined this, the term syndrome X back in, in the 90s, where he, he, he described that even people with normal glucose tolerance, if they were insulin resistant, had to do it with high levels of insulin. And this was a pyrrhic victory in that that drove, or at least was associated with a range of cardiovascular risk factors. And, 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 and so they, they suffered other adverse consequences of the, of the insulin resistance. It also, insulin resistance, explains why obesity is found in over 80% of people with type 2 diabetes. Obesity is the strongest risk factor for the development of type 2 diabetes. And it is so because as BMI goes up, fasting insulin, and this is, non, this is in non-diabetic uh, individuals, data from my colleague Nick Wareham, you clear a uh, continuous increase in insulin levels even among non-diabetic individuals with a huge variation between individuals that we still have yet to fully explain. So one of the key questions, and one I've been asking for many, many years, because my lab is focused on insulin resistance, is how do you get from obesity, on the one hand, to a defective glucose handling in liver and muscle, the two key tissues that cause insulin resistance? How does that happen? Well, if you asked 100 diabetologists these, these days at a clinical meeting, they'd probably say, we know that. We've been, we've been to the meetings. We know that how that happens. Uh, it happens because of the big bad fat cell. It happens because you, your fat cell expands, your adipose tissue gets inflamed, and, and all these inflammatory stuff does bad things to muscle and liver and causes insulin resistance. Bit of a problem there in that the genetic, human genetics doesn't really support that, and every attempt to block any of these has never had any impact on insulin resistance. So even though it's probably the commonest hypothesis, it's not one that I'm particularly wedded to. 
I think a much more attractive idea is a rather older one, in that the idea that the defective insulin handling in, in liver and muscle that results as a result of obesity is a result of fat in the wrong place. Your adipose tissue is a professional organ designed specifically to, con to, to, to contain and release adipose uh, fat free fatty acid as you need it. And you all need it in the fasting state overnight, your heart depends on it. So your adipose tissue is not a bad organ, it's a necessary organ for your survival. But contrary to popular belief, it is not infinitely expandable. And there is a range of expandability of adipose tissue. And, and therefore you can reach the safe limit of storage of nutrients in your adipose tissue. And when you do that, you start to redirect those uh, nutrients to uh, uh, places they shouldn't be, the non-professional tissues for, for lipid storage, such as muscle and liver. And that's where the real mischief happens. And I suppose we got that insight from often these paradigmatic experiments of nature, because we've been studying, myself and my colleague, David Savage, uh, a wonderful clinician scientist in Cambridge, we've been studying the condition of lipodystrophy for many decades now. We've been studying people who can't make fat tissue, either make limited amounts of it, or they can't make any of it at all. But they're not, these people are not thin. These are not thin, healthy people. These are people who cannot make fat tissue. And contrary to popular, you, know, you, you might think, well, that's great. You've not able to make fat tissue. You must do really well. They all get all the metabolic complications that you would expect in an obese person. And they get it earlier and more severely than obesity because they simply do not have a residue in which they can get a place, a reservoir in which they can store adipose tissue. And when we compare them, we've been working on people who have defects in insulin's ability to signal and then comparing them to lipodystrophy. And everything you see in this syndrome X metabolic syndrome, every feature is completely replicated and replicated 20 years earlier in people who have lipodystrophy. So it's fine. So that's a nice example, but is that really relevant to common or garden metabolic syndrome. Well, you can only do that by studying common or garden metabolic syndrome. And fortunately, in the institute I co-direct, we have our more lab-based science floors and we have a population science floor run by my colleague, Nick Wareham. So we're able to come together and bring population science together with lab science. And in, in this uh, rather nice example, what we've done is we found variants in the genome that make you, give you that insulin resistance uh, 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 problem. And, and we did it for people, who, we took obesity out of the equation, corrected everything for, took obesity out, and then said, what genetic variants make you insulin resistant and give you high triglycerides and low HDL and high insulin? And we found about 53 variants that unequivocally, I mean, within hundreds of thousands of people do this very powerfully. And then we added them together. And so what do the people look like who carry the bad variants? What do they look like? Well, do they look like, they certainly look more like apples than pears. They carry, many of these genes are in fat tissue. But the dramatic thing is what, the, what was really the signal was the people who were at most risk of running into trouble. It wasn't that they had big bellies. It was that they had small bums. It was the inability to store fat in the, in the lower part of the body. The driver of this metabolic syndrome was the inability to store fat in, in gluteal and legs, not necessarily the, the thing that we look at and say, oh, it's a, well, the only problem with that is that's the only place where you can put it because you cannot genetically store it in the safe place. So it's that lack of safe adipose storage that is really a big driver in the common metabolic system. So in the face of nutrient overload, those individuals who are not able to put it in the safe places are the ones who run into trouble. And that led me to sort of this rather tongue in cheek model, which I use for patients and undergraduates and, and things. I think it's quite helpful uh, to sort of think about it. I call it the soggy bathroom floor model of metabolic disease. I mean, you can imagine you go to a cheap hotel and somebody's left a check on the bathroom and someone's left a plug out, but that's fine because the floor is fine because there's a constant flow through and you stored a certain amount of triglyceride in your storage capacity and everything's tickety-boo. Now our model of, of, of developing metabolic disease is as follows. Of course, we all think that if we have increased energy intake and that's greater than our energy expenditure, if we don't run around and don't move around, we eventually build up an excessive and then we get into trouble. And that's when the ectopic lipid in, in muscle and liver uh, happens. That leads to the insulin resistance I mentioned to you in liver and, and, in, and, and in muscle. That is a driver of all of these risk factors for having heart attacks and strokes. Uh, and then you beta cell, your poor beta cell says, hey, this is really hard. So the beta cell upregulates and makes more insulin and tries to keep glucose controlled until it can no longer do that. And then develops hyperglycemia, which is the diabetes. <clears throat> 
So diabetes is a very late stage in, 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 this, in this development. Of course, not everybody has the same size bath. So <clears throat> that is where this adipose uh, uh, risk factors for your adipose depot comes in, in that individuals with limited ability to store adipose, store fat in adipose tissue are at much higher risk of developing diabetes, even when they're only modestly over, calor over caloried. And so this model really helps us think about how we do treat things like diabetes and how perhaps we should treat disorders like diabetes. For example, we currently treat things pretty late on. What we try and do with insulin, sulfonylureas, db 4 is to try and restore this compensatory hyperinsulinemia right back at this, at this day, very, very late on. We then use drugs that don't really treat insulin resistance. They treat the hyperinsulinemia. We, you either give it SGLT2 inhibitors, which put glucose out into the urine, or metformin, which, <clears throat> which actually does most of its work, I believe, by putting glucose into the gut, into the gut lumen, not the gut lumen, into the gut epithelium, much more so than actually impacting on, on hepatic uh, uh, production of, of, of insulin. Of course, physical activity and exercise is good at improving insulin resistance. And that's what we, we recommend from any people because that does improve glucose uptake into skeletal muscle. But the last few years are seeing some hope because at last, after many, many decades of trying, we're beginning to have safe and effective appetite suppressants. And for those individuals who's, who, who are driven to eat too much and who cannot cope with the amount, these new drugs which activate on the GLP or the GIP receptor are proving dramatically beneficial. And I think we'll have it play an increasing role in our management of these, of these disorders. And any diabetologist here knows that's happening already. And of course, we can start thinking about other ways. We can, for example, think about ways of improving the size of our adipose storage capacity. And we do have quite a powerful drug that can do that. But unfortunately, it has some off-target uh, effects, which, which are unfortunate. But still, it's a logical therapeutic target to try and improve the size of our bath. And our, some of our own research is, is, is focused on that area at the moment. And of course, we'd like to do uh, more in terms of being able to remove atopic lip, lip, lip muscle and liver. So I think what I can say is that our increased knowledge of the pathophysiology of these metabolic disorders are putting us in the most exciting position we've ever been to try and pharmacologically improve the health and well-being of people with type 2, two, type two diabetes. And the next decade or so, we'll see a great improvement in the quality of care for people with type 2 diabetes because of these new and improved uh, therapies. I'm going to move now to hormone number two, uh, uh, which, which controls about the control of mammalian energy balance. Way back in the 1940s and 50s, scientists in both the UK and America uh, took rats. And if you don't, this is a growth curve of a rat. I don't know if you know, rats never stop growing. So if you see a, if you see a big rat, it's an old rat. Uh, so so um, and what they did was they simply um, underfed it for a couple of weeks, took it, put it on 50% rations, and then put it back in the cage with free rations. And what the rat does is, is rapidly, it eats back to exactly the trajectory it was going to be on before. And if you overfeed it, it does exactly the same. It under eats for a week or so, and then goes back to the trajectory it was on before. And the light bulb moment was, this must be a regulated phenomenon. Rats aren't just eating what you get make available to them. They're eating what, they, what, is, what they're determined by their trajectory. So that means they must be sensing it somehow. And of course, doctors knew what was going on because we knew back from the 1880s that there was a sensor for weight because we knew that if you developed a tumor in your brain, the German physicians in the area of the hypothalamus, you almost always became severely obese with hypothalamic damage, immediately pointing to that's where the sensor is. It's in that part of the brain, the hypothalamus. And of course, it took many, many more decades for, for Jeff Friedman in, in, in uh, Rockefeller University discovered uh, the sensor that the brain uses to sense how much fat we have stored. And it's called leptin, and it's a hormone, my old friend, a hormone. And it goes from the fat cell, it, go, oops, it goes to the brain. And uh, if you lack leptin, the animals are, eat all the time and, and they have low energy expenditure. You give tiny amounts of leptin back, even tiny amounts directly into the hypothalamus, you totally restore normal body weight in, the, in, in, in these animals. And it was around that time that my own lab started to work <coughs> on human obesity and we worked we're wonderful colleagues who were all graduate students at the time are still in our institute as professors and distinguished investigators. And we discovered, and we and others discovered a variety of human genetic disorders, which inevitably resulted in severe obesity. The mutations in these genes have, these people will always develop severe obesity. And where they were, whether they were either in the leptin pathway itself 
or in the downstream part of the hypothalamus, the immediate signals downstream of leptin within, within uh, the hypothalamus. And so here is a, is a, is a model of ins, leptin. In, uh, these cells are also sense, sense insulin. Uh, uh, and there, there's a couple of different neurons. I won't go into the boring detail, but they're called melanocortins. The POMC neurons make peptides called melanocortins, and they are critical for energy balance. I will tell you one fascinating thing. If you take these neurons here, in a, in a, in a mouse brain, there's only about a few hundred, maybe 300 of them. If you kill them off in the mouse brain, the mouse will never eat again. The mouse will, will socialize, it will, it will, it will, it will reproduce, try to reproduce, it will have, but it will simply never, it will starve itself to death. These few hundred cells alone are enough to completely control eating behavior. <clears throat> so this area of our brain is absolutely central to the whole biology of whether we're hungry, whether we wish to eat <laughs> or not. We have the great privilege of being able to find some of these children with this unfortunate disorder, whether well, I mean, it's way fortunate because it's reversible. And we were the first people to be able to give leptin to cure a leptin deficiency state and dramatically improve. Now, many, many children around the world with this disorder will benefit from recombinant leptin therapy, which has totally restored their, 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 their normal health and, and, and weight. And we've learned a huge amount about biology with it. I mean, one just very nice example done with my wonderful neuroscience colleague, Paul Fletcher, as well as obviously Sadaf Faruqi, uh, where, where we showed images of food and non-food to children who had no leptin. And you showed them images of money and then they, nothing happened. You showed them images of any food and their brain, the areas of addiction and reward light up like a beacon. You give leptin and within two to three days, that response is completely obliterated even before any change in body weight. So here is this hormone coming from your fat cell and going to your brain and absolutely dominating the areas of the brain that you think you're in control of. In the absence of leptin, if any of you here had no leptin, you would not be able to listen to my talk. You'd all just want to be eating. So this is there, so this is there in all of you right now, and it's working right now. <laughs> and and uh, without it, you, you wouldn't be able to do anything. You'd just be completely obsessed with, with food, with food seeking behavior. But why, therefore, is it not a blockbusting drug? It's fantastic in leptin deficiency in children with lipodystrophy who have no leptin because they have no fat cells and get terrible lipid overload, including here, this poor girl with lipid droplets in her skin. Uh, when you give leptin, you get tremendous benefits in those conditions, but it doesn't work really well in ordinary obesity. Why is that? Well, it's because leptin doesn't work like a, like a kind of regular hormone that you give more and more happens. It's more like that. It's got a very, very <clears throat> sharp dose response curve. Leptin works extremely well between the starved and the tra transition to normal nutrition state and then flattens off rapidly in, in, the, uh, in, 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 in normal and overweight uh, uh, states. Uh, there's still some hope. and We, we, we did a reanalysis with Alex DePauli and Amgen of an old uh, common obesity trial. And if you look at people who have relatively low leptin or regular obesity to start with and see, see their response over 24 weeks, you can see a better response in those individuals who start off with lower leptin uh, uh, levels. So there's still some hope that we may have more than just the very rare individuals who benefit from this. But, you know, in, 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 in many ways, other drugs have taken over from leptin as the promising, as, as the most promising anti-obesity agents. Uh, our colleagues in, in Germany and in France, Karine Clement, and, uh, uh, Heiko Kruda and others, uh, discovered deficiency of the next step down, the POMC neurons. And those children also severely become severely obese. And in, in using an octopeptide analog of, that, that, of, of melanocortin that binds to the melanocortin-4 receptor, set melanotide, you give that to the children, they get dramatic therapeutic responses. And more recently, they've shown that in a much larger group of patients, you get huge effects on both food intake, appetite, scores, et cetera, in the children who lack that signaling molecule within the brain. So another deficiency state that can be reversed by, by, by appropriate melanocortin. And these, this drug is now licensed for these uh, children with these rarer forms of obesity and ongoing phase two and three trials and Sadaf is now leading the largest uh, uh, one of these uh, trials uh, in the world in subtypes of, of, of obesity. One thing that struck me and got me rather interested and put me down a slightly side issue was that children and uh, young adults who have POMC deficiency as well as being obese, they don't go into puberty. They're completely hypogonadal and you give them MC4R and nothing happens. There was no report of any improvement. So targeting their melanocortin-4 receptor does not correct that aspect of work. 
So that took us, and that and other ideas took us down a route. And I'm just gonna, this paper was just published last week in Nature. Uh, by, by studying a different pathway in the brain, we actually discovered an entirely bifurcating pathway where a separate set of signals go through a different melanocortin receptor and regulate sexual maturation, growth, and how much muscle we put on versus how much fat, 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 fat we put on. And in a way, what we're done really is to find a new model. Uh, here's a model of food and food energy and how we acquire and retain it depends on this part of the hypothalamic circuitry working. But what we decide to do with it, whether we put it into growth, lean mass, and puberty, is entirely due down another circuitry. We discovered that through studying humans who lack MC3 or mice, <coughs> et cetera, with a wonderful group of colleagues, both in Cambridge and, and elsewhere. And if you lack the MC3R receptor, essentially you're very small, you have very low lean mass, and you don't go into puberty until your 20s. So this <clears throat> receptor is critical for mediating nutrition effects on, 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 uh, 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 on, on growth and probably explains the, the increase in adult height that we've seen over the last century and also the reduction in the rate of pu puberty that have occurred. It's the pathway which has explained essentially the secular changes, but well, the nutrition explains the secular changes, but this provides the mechanism for whereby our nutritional state has turned us into earlier puberty and, and, and taller people over the last hundred years. It's nice when have new, new hypotheses have explanatory power. So we just call, we test a, you know, just, just a little thought experiment. What happens when you're leptin deficient? Well, you eat a lot, you're obese, you have reduced energy expenditure, but you also have extreme pubertal delay and some reduced linear growth, particularly in mice, you've got very reduced linear growth. And if you have a human or humans who don't have melanocortin-4 receptor, they have all of this, but they have none of this. They grow perfectly well and they go into puberty at perfectly normal time. What we've just discovered is that MC3 receptor is the one that activates through the growth hormone releasing hormone and through the central controllers of reproduction, provides that alternative circuitry that turns nutrition into how we grow and how we be mature as a species. And, and I should mention that again, in terms of translational, there are many, many conditions characterized by sarcopenia, not, not enough lean mass, cancer, cachexia, other conditions, uh, uh, people coming off ITU after months of ventilation with COVID, uh, who have great difficulty putting on muscle mass with, uh, when, they, when they come off uh, after a serious illness. And we think that tweaking uh, the drugs that activate melanocortin receptors towards the MC3 receptor will be a powerful potential route towards improving the outcomes for those type of patients. My final story, and I hope you're bearing with the, with the flood of, 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 of some hardcore science, but I'll just tell you a brief final story. Hormones were discovered over 120 years ago. Surely we've discovered all the hormones. And the wonderful thing for an endocrinologist is the answer is no, we've only started scratching the surface. There are many, many more, I'm sure. And one such one I'm gonna tell you in about three or four slides about is, is GDF-15. What is GDF-15? Well. Sam Bright, a lovely clinical immunologist in Sydney, is the grandfather, a father of this. Of this. And he, he was beavering away in his lab in St. Vincent's Hospital in, 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 in Sydney. He's a proper practicing clinical immunologist with a lab on the side. And he discovered this peptide about nearly 30 years ago. And he's been working on it ever since. And uh, he, he was a member of the TGF beta superfamily. It's a dimeric, it's got two chains, protein, it's linked plenty of it in the circulation. And, it, it's, it's, <clears throat> and he discovered it in activate, activated macrophages when they were stim stimulated. And he, did a lot of figuring out what was, what was well, happening in the circulation. Now, it's found at high levels in huge numbers of conditions. If we measure it in people, in fact, it actually predicts death. If you measure GDF-15 in your plasma, it's one of the strongest predictors of when you're gonna die. So it, 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 it is a generic marker of, of, of organismal stress. Uh, <clears throat> so its levels are increased acutely in things like chemotherapy, altitude, irradiation. First trimester of pregnancy, it goes up massively. Uh, infection, but it's chronically increased in things like cancer cachexia and the cachexia of heart, of heart failure. And just four years ago, four different pharmaceutical companies <clears throat> found the receptor. And the remarkable thing is that the receptor is in one place and one place only. So this substance is made everywhere in the body, it can be made anywhere, but it only has receptors in a few hundred cells. And those cells are in the area, the so-called chemoreceptor trigger zone of the part of your brain. They're the area 
which, which when you stimulate with things like apomorphine to make people sick, that's exactly the area that they're, that, that, that they're in uh, naturally. And if you give GDF-15 to animals, it makes them sick. It makes, gives them illness behavior. They sit in the corner. They, if they can vomit, they do vomit. If they, they, they don't eat, they lose weight. It, 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 it has uh, these adverse effects. And I hypothesized in an editorial a few years ago, what, why the hell we'd evolve such a thing? Uh, and the idea is that it's basically a sentinel hormone. It's, it's a signal that, tell, uh, that, that our body tells our brain, you're doing something very bad, please stop. Because not only does GDF-15 make you sick now, if we give it to animals and we've done this and give it to them with a, paired with a particular taste or a particular color, they never want to go back to that taste or color again. So they perceive the stimulus as aversive. Uh, so unlike leptin, leptin makes you not eat, in, 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 but it doesn't do any aversive, but this is aversive. People don't, you know, animals and humans don't like it. <clears throat> when, when it, and it's given to them. So the idea being, it evolved when we exposed, I mean, we're hunter-gatherers largely most of them, when we were exposed to, to things that were bad for us and toxic, we, we it generated GDF-15 through, through, through toxicity in cells, that went to our brain, made us throw up immediately, but also said, never eat that blue mushroom again. <laughs> and so there are, but there are immediate and obvious clinical impacts. Right now, there are at least two large-scale clinical phase two clinical trials of anti-GDF-15 blockade in cancer cachexia. Levels are very high in many cancers. If you take tumors of cancer, here's a, here's a transplanted ovarian tumor put into a mouse, given a, a non-specific antibody, the mice loses weight, giving a proper, given a blocking antibody, the weight, weight loss is blocked almost completely. It's dramatic in many, many animal models of cancer cachexia, and now is going into clinical trials in widespread. And we're doing some of this work with Charlie Swanton at the Crick Institute in non-small cell lung cancer, cancer ourselves. An area we become much more directly involved with is the fact that about 80% of women develop nausea and vomiting in the first trimester of pregnancy, but a small number develop hyperemesis gravidarum, which is very serious and can actually be lethal, as it apparently was for Charlotte Bronte, who died in the third month of her pregnancy, with the most likely cause of her death being severe dehydration due to hyperemesis gravidarum. She was about three months pregnant at the time. We found with our colleagues, uh, Ashley Moffat and Richard Kay, that GDF-15 is about the third highest peptide produced out of the human trophoblast. It's a very, 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 very high in pregnancy and it's produced by the, <clears throat> the trophoblast. The elevate levels are higher in women with nausea and vomiting than in not. And then our, my, my, <clears throat> Marlena Fejo, a wonderful woman, a sufferer herself who lost a child uh, during a hyperemesis pregnancy, and which, which sent her off in her, in her quest to find its biology. She showed, most importantly, that the, big, the top gene in a hypothesis-free genomic study that, that determines whether you're at risk of hyperemesis is GDF-15. So we have both biochemical and genetic evidence that, that, that GDF-15 is driving. So I think this provides the first hope that at last we have some mechanistic insight into what's going on in this, in, in this illness. And that GDF-15 may well be necessary, if not sufficient, for the causation of hyperemesis with a real opportunity for therapeutic blockade with agents, for example, that don't cross the placenta and, and don't have the worries of things like thalidomide and the, the disasters of the, of the past. So I think it provides real hope for, for such uh, uh, interventions. <clears throat> Finally, the last story coming back around to diabetes because we've worked on type two diabetes. Is there any situation where GDF-15 can be good for you? Well, we showed with colleagues that if you give metformin to people, you increase GDF-15, not to the sorts of levels you see in cachexia, much more modestly, a little, a little sniff of this stuff. It goes up about two or three fold in response to metformin. And if you give it even in a clinical trial, and this is what we did this with Navid Sitar in Glasgow, you can see even over 18 months, it's sustained. You about double, anyone on metformin has about twice the level of GDF-15 that they have when, when, when you're not on, on metformin. Now we'd love to know, does that matter? Does it matter? And that's where you have to turn to the mouse because we haven't got at the moment an antibody that we could use to check it in humans. So we said, we'd, let's turn to the mouse. Yes, if you give it to the mouse, you can increase GDF-15 dramatically with metformin. Let's turn to the mouse. And we did that with my colleague, Tony Cole. Uh, and uh, Tony, these lovely experiments uh, where you give metformin to uh, an animal. I, I should point out that metformin, as well as reducing blood glucose, is known to reduce body weight by about 4 to 5% in almost all people who take it, who can, who can tolerate it. It has a weight loss of effect 4 to 5%. And same as two in animals, you give metformin to animals and they lose weight. You take a mouse and you take out its GDF-15, you knock it out with a genetic engineering technique and you give metformin and nothing happens. So the, the weight loss was entirely 
<coughs> stopped by the, by the absence of, and, and the same is true of the effect of metformin on food intake and the mice, the knockout, no, it, no effect at all. And where was this happening? Well, strangely enough, if you say metformin to most, they'll say liver, that's where it goes. What we found almost nothing happening in the liver. What we found is that metformin is concentrated in the gut enterocytes and in the renal tubules where it's excreted from. And in those cells, it causes tremendous stress because it's a mitochondrial poison in effect. And because those cells are effectively poisoned, they make GDF-15 because that's the screaming signal of a poison cell. And these cells produce large amounts of GDF-15 in not just colon, but along the intestine and in the kidney. And they are the source of, the, we've recently taken the mouse and taken out GDF-15 only from the gut and we proved that this is the correct, this is where it's coming from largely uh, in, 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 in animals. So Paracelsus would have known that because he knew that, that all, many, many drugs were poisons. And, and the only difference between a drug and a poison is the dose. And so we have been given one of the commonest drugs we give and been giving since the 1950s to huge billions of mankind is in effect a poison. And it's exerting a large amount of its effect to producing a, a normal response that happens when we as an organism are poisoned. And that is part of its therapeutic efficacy. <laughs> so I've told you a tale of three hormones, insulin, leptin, and GDF-15. I hope I've <clears throat> given you some uh, interesting uh, things to take, tidbits to take home about those uh, uh, three hormones. Uh, I'll, I'll finish with a quote from Ernest Starling. He said, in physiology, as in all other sciences, no discovery is useless, no curiosity misplaced or too ambitious. Every advance will sooner or later play its part in the service of man. I'd like to thank my colleagues and collaborators. I've mentioned most of the people throughout, our funders, but above all, the patients and participants and families who worked with us to do this research over the last several decades. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Theo. I'm just going to ask, just ask you um, and join us on the platform. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. And, and um, uh, Professor O'Reilly, thank you very much indeed. I mean, it's really humbling. And, and, and daunting, I think, to, to say any words and follow up to that. But thank you very much indeed. And I know, uh, as Chief Executive of Diabetes UK, of the huge important impact of your work. Uh, just very briefly, that, that, that story of insulin arriving in the world was, was the genesis of, of the charity that is here today. Uh, the short story, R.D. Lawrence, a clinician at, at King's College Hospital uh, himself uh, with type 1 diabetes uh, in 1920, uh, found common cause with H.G. Wells, one of his patients with type 1. Uh, and they together, some 10 years after insulin was discovered, decided to cooperate uh, to make sure that care was equitable for all people uh, living with type 1 diabetes. Probably the first example, 15 years before the NHS came into being, the first example of, of patients coming together to cooperate to, 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 to achieve equitable care, and of course, to make sure that people could have insulin, that life-saving innovation. Uh, that transformed and, and Ardy Lawrence himself went to live, went on to live for 50 years uh, with his type 1 diabetes, completely unheard of just, just 10 years before. Um, that spirit of, of a community of people um, from a condition that was a, a death sentence to one which has now become a long-term condition, that sense of community lives on. Uh, and uh, I think we've had a sense of the huge opportunities that lie before us, both in type 1 and critically in type 2 diabetes, one in 10 adults in this country now living with type 2 diabetes. And we lack evidence and we lack energy and we certainly lack resources in the vital research uh, that needs to take place in that. So um, I just close by, by once again uh, thanking Professor O'Reilly for, for all the work you're doing in this space. I know we as a charity uh, benefit hugely as well from your wise counsel. Thank you. Right, well, we're going to have a Q&A now. Um, I just wanted to add one comment on what we've heard so far generally and that it is a very opportune year to be talking about these things it seems to me we've got a hundred year centenary of insulin discovery we've got an epidemic of obesity in this country and in the developed world i mean what better topics to consider uh, at a time like this so thank you gentlemen um right now so moderation turned on no questions that i can see um but i have um i just would like to fire one thing at you actually if i may Stephen. Uh, gdf 15 it just seems to me that there's a possibility of a sinister use of that um in terms of conditioning psychological conditioning uh, an aversion therapy etc am i imagining that or is that well, i think that's a little i mean what i will say is that the GLP-1 agents were the ones I, to I told you about that, that, that are um, 
use now in obesity therapeutics, if you take them in a animal and give them in the doses we use, they're also aversive. On, <laughs> so it's not unique. <laughs> so there are many things that, that and of course, as we know, when we give those therapies to humans, we have to gradually increase the dose and we have to get people used to them. So it's not, uh, I, mean, I think there are many worse things. We, I, I don't think it'll, it'll turn into a, an instrument of torture. And mm -hmm. we've got plenty of things already. We can give lithium chloride by injection, or we can give apple morphine, which are, you know, there are many, we have many nauseants things <laughs> already that we don't, that I, I, I don't even need to worry too much about, about that. Yeah, well, opportunities may be taken if they're there. <laughs> yes. um, Albert, do we have any live questions from the live audience? People might have to fire in here, either electronically or via hand. Yes, yes, in the middle there. You'll have to speak up, I'm afraid. I'm not sure there's a microphone. You might, you might have to take it out so I can see your lips, <laughs> or that we can see your lips. Uh, what you might be asking is about, I mean, so, so statins uh, have saved probably more lives than almost any other drug we've taken for the last 50 years. So uh, I start with that. I mean, they're an incredible advance and they've, they've, they've resulted in many, many more grandparents being with their grandchildren than, than almost any advance in pharmacology that we've, we've, we've seen. Having said that, they're not perfect drugs and there probably is a modest, small increase in risk of getting type two diabetes. In, in, in people who take statins. So I'm not, not, I'm not sure that's what you were referring to. So, so there's no doubt that, uh, that, there's a, the, 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 that the epidemiology indicates that, that statin use does increase the risk of type two diabetes, possibly by impairing insulin secretion, a little bit by mechanisms that are not entirely clear, but, but that, 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 is, is that what you're, you, you're asking? Yes. Uh... I mean, so, so leptin effectively, mirrors your fat mass in most people. So it, it, it goes up in the plasma, the more, you, the more fat you've got. Um, but it, doesn't, it isn't very effective in high doses. It, 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 I mean, the physiology of leptin is such that it evolved to be the signal that tells us we're starving. It works more like Sherlock Holmes' dog that didn't bark in the night. It, 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 it's there to signal in its absence rather than its presence. So, so, so the biology of leptin is such that if you're starving, leptin drops below a certain level. And that is the signal that tells you to focus on eating, focus on finding food, switching off reproduction, reduce your interest in sex or anything else other than finding food. And that's where its biology primarily lies. Right. Um, I've got a couple there. I've just got to fire one in here quickly that's come on the um, iPad here. I'm asked a very topical question here. I'm not sure who's best place to ask that. Why are diabetic patients more susceptible to COVID? Extremely good question. Yeah, it uh, is. <laughs> and, and we've looked into, and we and many other people have looked into it. Uh, so are obese people, of course. Uh, uh, and, and so is it, is it obesity? Is it, is, are they independent risks? Is, is, there's no doubt that even in the absence of, of diabetes, obesity uh, makes people prone to COVID. I mean, my view of this is that, that uh, COVID essentially kills through a microthrombotic pathology in, in the lung. So the way, the way, when people die when you do of COVID, they die because their lungs can no longer exchange oxygen. And there's only two reasons that can happen. One is the lung epithelium doesn't work, or secondly, the clotting or the vascular system. And what happens in COVID, unlike many other pneumonias, you get massive amounts of microvascular clotting within the lung. And we know that states of obesity, insulin resistance, diabetes predispose to microvascular clotting through a range of processes on the endothelium, the platelet, the clotting factors, a whole range. So it's kind of a collusion of risk factors for that microthrombosis that I think is probably the most likely reason why people with obesity and people with diabetes do badly with, with COVID. Thank you. The, the, the evidence, if you're a well-controlled person with type one diabetes, the evidence is you don't do particularly badly with COVID. And as long as you, you, you remain, so the risk tends to be more related to the obesity insulin resistance. Yeah. Side, I think I see Professor Hockaday here. Derek, very I'm nice to see <laughs> anyway, either way. Should have been. <laughs> Steve, I wasn't sure why women have more than one child. I wasn't sure what the other 14 did. But someone has asked that one cause of ravenous appetite is hypoglycemia. Yes, absolutely. And what happens to that? Nothing. It has very little effect on, 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 on leptin. Le leptin is a very slow tonic. It's, it's, it's a much, it's not an immediate, uh, it's, it's, it's much longer, it's a much longer term. So what's driving the appetite? Um, direct effects of, you know, you, you put 2 deoxy you block, you block uh, it, I mean, my colleague Mark Evans in Cambridge does a lot of this, you, 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 you can block uh, uh, 
glucose metabolism in selective hypothalamic neurons by 2-deoxyglucose, and the animals eat like crazy. So, so there's direct glucose sensing by, it's an emergency signal in the brain, overrides all the long-term. Uh, uh, um, uh, yeah. Thank you. Now I've got a question here. Um, will pharmacology obviate the need for hyperbaric surgery? And if so, when? Now, on a, just, sorry, I'm just going to say, on a more sort of yes. political, political front and Diabetes UK yes, view, I mean, do you see the drugs coming in as a solution here to obesity and type 2? Or have we got a heavy reliance on, on bariatric surgery at the moment, of course. So, I, I think the answer is all. So I think yeah. it's both and. and. And I think the problem at the moment is we don't have the evidence to, to know which therapy is best suited to, to, to which individual. Uh, and I think for many reasons, part cultural, part lack of, 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 of investment, uh, we haven't pursued a path of really getting that evidence uh, in place. So I think that's changing. Um, I, I think there's a heightened awareness of... Uh, the risks of living with weight uh, and, and a heightened interest, I think, in, in, in best. So I think the answer is it, 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 it's, it's neither very low calorie diets on their own, nor is it bariatric surgery on its own, nor, it's, nor is it uh, pharmacological compounds. I think we, we need a mixture. And, and I know people living with obesity very, very, very much want that opportunity uh, and want to have that ability to uh, ha have multiple pathways and, and particularly ones which are evidence based and show they may benefit mm. from them. And I guess there's a sort of ongoing arm wrestle, isn't there, between what medicine and ch charities like Diabetes UK are trying to do and <clears throat> the commercial push in the other direction, um, and providing us with a, a very, very food-rich environment. Yeah, I, mean, I think the solution, I mean, uh, Nick Walden and I were discussing this before, and indeed last week when we met, there's a ridiculous uh, uh, setting up a false dichotomy between the fact that we need to have public health investment into making the environment less obesogenic at the same time as treating people who have suffering from obesity and suffering the adverse consequences of it. There's, there's, I, I see no conflict. In fact, the institute that I co-direct, I co-direct with a public health doctor, Nick Wareham, and, and whose main focus is on those, and, so we, and we talk all the time. So I, 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 don't, I, I see, you know, we solved hypertension effectively, we really made a big impact on hypertension through a combination of improvements in public health matters, screening and, and, and et cetera, combined with cheap and, and effective multiple combination pharmacotherapy. And I see that we'll, we'll deal with obesity, if, we, if we're sensible and grown up, we'll deal with obesity in the same manner. I see, I see, I see very little uh, difference between how we, we should deal with the two problems. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I just add to that, I think the challenge, I think if you absolutely say it correctly, if we treat that in a grown up way that the difficulty is the public discourse on obesity just far too readily uh, redacts and reduces down to, to, to essentially one of personal responsibility. And I think we've seen very clearly uh, today that, that it's far, far more complex than that. But as long as the big public debate uh, sits as one uh, around personal responsibility, I feel we won't make the progress we need to make. I, I think when we find that, the, that when we have the clinical trials in obesity that show improvements in mortality, which I think will happen with the GL, with, with, with the GLP one and other agonists. That will that will put the you know, that, will put, that will be transformative. I think if you can actually say to Nice, these are agents which actually save lives, uh, and let's let's put a price on that and let's see what we can play uh, for that. And, and, and so I think that will happen and we'll get there. Yeah. Yes, in the middle here. You raised the question that some people in the states can't afford insulin. There are only three manufacturers making insulin, Novo Nordisk, Eli Lilly, and I've forgotten the third one. Why is it so expensive? And why we, the medical profession, have done nothing about it? Well, I think you'll find that a large number of medical professionals are trying to do something about it. Many of the charities are, 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 are campaigning actively to try and understand what, it, you know, uh, you have to ask the pharmaceutical industry why why the price of insulin is as high as it is in the U.S. I mean, I'm sure it isn't in this country because we have got co collective bargaining with with the pharmaceutical industry, and we, we do. But it is frightening to read about the number of people in the U.S. who who are paying you know several hundred dollars per vial of insulin and and unable to afford the, their medication in in a in a you know in a civilized uh, wealthy country. Uh, so I've got a question for Chris here. Um, how badly has Diabetes UK been affected by the pandemic? Uh, that's a very generous question. And thanks for asking. Uh, um, I, I mean, it, financially, uh, actually, we, we've borne it very well for, for various reasons. Uh, as, a, as a charity with, with a charitable purpose, we've been incredibly hard pressed. And um, 
you know, were HG Wells and RD Lawrence here today, I wonder what their, what, what their view would be on how well we've supported people. But, 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 but the call upon the charity has been immense. We've met it as we've been able to. Uh, and we wanted also to make a contribution to, so we funded research studies in real time in the depths of the pandemic to really try and understand some of this intersectionality between type one, type two and COVID-19. So, you know, I, I feel, uh, I, I feel we, we, we've traversed that in reasonably good shape, but there's, there's, there's much in front of us, much that we still don't know. And just to come back to that last question, uh, 11th of January next year will be the first time that, that insulin was used on somebody. Wouldn't it be good to have a debate about insulin availability around the world? Uh, I think there are structural issues in the US that are driving some of that exacerbated and heightened prices, but there are many other parts of the world where there is no insulin. Uh, and wouldn't it be great if, if we use that moment? 100 years is a very, very long time uh, in modern times, and we really should not be living comfortably with the fact that uh, it's not accessible. I don't think Banting Best, uh, Colin or McLeod would have wanted that to be the case. I have another question. What are the limitations to producing a, an effective closed loop glucose control system? Um, so not my particular area of expertise. In my own institute, we have a wonderful man, Roman Hovorka, a fantastic scientist who does a, a lot of that work. I wouldn't claim, it's, it's pretty far off my piece, um, uh, but I, I, um, I mean, it, it, it's getting there. I mean, it's been, Roman is demonstrating effectiveness in a whole range of settings, not only in, in, in adults with type one diabetes, but in children, in pregnant women, on use on the ITU and the artificial. So I, I think it really is becoming pretty mainstream and, and is not far from broader utility. I mean, so, so the sensors are good. Uh, the communication algorithms are getting better and that's what Roman's expertise is in and the delivery systems are better. So I think there is real opportunity for broader, wider use of, of, of the artificial diabetes. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, on periodontal disease. Um, I mean, I think the point is at least partially taken here. Um, but there's another implication of that, of course, which is cardiovascular disease as well. And there's some important, the periodontal disease and it's as a driver of cardiovascular disease yes. is another important area. <clears throat> and the, that's an area that in fact, the cardiac cardiology community is increasingly engaged with. Um, so so I, think, I, think the, I think the penny is dropping on that one, uh, maybe belatedly. Mm. Uh, any other questions from the audience here? Yes. That's a very interesting question, one of which I'm participating in a current debate and our, our article, very long with about 100 authors will soon be appearing. I hope in the thing. There's, there's a very strong lobby that suggests that the carbohydrate insulin hypothesis, in other words, that a major driver of obesity is the fact the specific role of carbohydrates to increase insulin to, to, to therefore stimulate uh, uh, appetite. Paradoxically, of course, insulin is it, it given directly into the brain or even uh, infused in, and, 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 and hitting the hypothalamus through the median eminence is actually an appetite suppressant. Insulin itself, of course, hypoglycemia, as Derek pointed out, is a strong appetite stimulant. I think we, I think we can reconcile, reconcile some of these hypotheses in the following way. I suspect there's a subgroup of people who respond to carbohydrate ingestion, particularly fast acting carbohydrate ingestion, by developing reactive hypoglycemia a few hours, hours after a meal. And it's that as a stimulus to another eating <coughs> episode, which may well be one of the links between uh, the, 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 the ingestion of carbohydrate. The simple increase in insulin itself is probably not. And, and we, can, we can say that through an experiment of nature. There's, there's a very large number of people who live in Greenland and in, and in Northern Canada, the Inuits, who have a, a very specific genetic defect which means they can't translocate glucose transporters in their muscle. So they spend all their postprandial time with huge amounts of insulin, uh, but they never become hypoglycemic. And they, the ones who carry this genetic variant are not one milligram heavier, heavier than their brothers and sisters who don't have it. So, so the, the experiment of nature has in a way been done in humans by taking people who have very, very high levels of insulin for large parts of the day and yet do not become very insulin resistant. But having said that, I think Tim Spector's work recently using free living humans, measuring their glucose and recording eating behavior is quite interesting and, and showing that there's quite a lot of people who do dip with glucoses down in the low twos. In, 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 and, and those individuals do seem to initiate eating episodes 
as a result of that. So I, and, and that happens more often after quick acting carbohydrate food. So I think there is a possible link in that way. Great. So I think we're just going to have one really fast question, if you don't mind. Quick question, quick answer. So, so, so I don't believe that type two exists at all. Um, I mean, I think type one is pretty well, sub, reasonably well subdefined as an autoimmune destruction of the pancreatic beta cell. Type two is basically everything that isn't. <laughs> type one. And there are many, many, many ways to get your blood glucose high. And the earlier it happens, the more, off, the more likely it is to have strong genetic predispositions. But there are numerous, I mean, we ourselves have discovered over you know, 15 different single gene disorders that can lead to a non-type one form of diabetes. And that's just scratching the surface. So there'll be, there'll be you know, there, there's a polygenic continuum that does predispose you to type two diabetes, and that's undoubted. So, so there's, a, there's a polygenic risk, but then there'll be multiple different pathways in multiple individuals because blood glucose is simply an end, an end measurement of, of a whole range of pathological processes that can lead to hyperglycemia. Where do you see the next reclassification going? Well, of course, we've already had the Modi's, and the Modi's was, you know, the Modi started as one thing, and now we have 12 Modi's. Um, so even the subclassification, insulin resistance started off with insulin receptoropathies. We now have you know, over a half a dozen at least disorders of insulin signaling. And as I say, we're only just beginning. Good. Thanks. Uh, Thank you very much. Well, I'd like, but we have to draw this to a close now, unfortunately. Um, uh, we've overshot a little bit, not surprisingly. I must say it is such a pleasure <clears throat> to have the chance of moderating an evening session like this where the talks are great. And the audience is so inquisitive and, uh, and forthright that we actually run out of time, not running out of questions, which is, of course, the moderator's nightmare. Um, and so thank you very much indeed, gentlemen. Uh, uh, terrific evening um, and for your contributions, both of you. Many thanks for coming. And thanks also very much to the Howard Foundation for uh, funding this and um, enabling it to happen in the first place. Um, RSM has done a great job, as it usually does. Um, and um, I'll just wish you well for the evening. Thanks for coming um, and um, have a safe trip home. Good night, everybody.